Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our session on troubleshooting Apache Beam issues in Dataflow. My name is Lauren, and I'm the content manager for the Google Cloud community. And joining us today is Google Cloud software engineer Pablo Estrada, who will be taking us through the content and answering your questions. So questions are encouraged, so please feel free to add that into the YouTube chat box, and we'll be sure to get to them either in the chat or at the end of the presentation today. We did receive uh, a few pre-submitted questions, so we'll be going through those first as well. For any questions we don't get to live, there will be a recap post in the Google Cloud community. So there's a link to that in the YouTube description that you can check out and uh, see after we close out today. All right, with that, I will hand it over to you, Pablo, to take us through the content today. All right, thank you, Lauren. Uh, <clears throat> all right, hello, everyone. I'm uh, happy to be here to, to talk about this. Um, this is me, it's my, it's an, it's an old picture of myself <laughs> too old. But anyway, so I'm a software engineer in Google. I've, I work on Dataflow. I've been working on Dataflow for six and a half years now. And uh, I'm also a PMC member for, uh, for Beam. Um, you might've seen me around in Stack Overflow or mailing lists if you have, you know, looked at those things. <clears throat> now, um, what is this talk in general? I'll tell you a little bit about um, some recent work that I did to build a meta template for Dataflow and Beam. <clears throat> and I, I'll tell you what that means in a bit. And I'll tell you some of the lessons that I learned and some tips. Um, and then after that, after talking about that in particular, I'll also share um, some uh, screenshots and examples of how to use the data flow monitoring UI to figure out issues with your with your jobs. Um, yeah. And so, you know, this is more or less the agenda. Again, we, um, I'll talk about, you know, why, why it's good to have a local, dev uh, local development environment, a quick feedback loop. Um, <coughs> And then, you know, my experience moving my testing to Dataflow. Um, and then, you know, I'll talk about the Dataflow tools that we have to troubleshoot the issues. Um, anyway, so, um, so I'll tell you about this meta template that, uh, that I had to work on. <coughs> um, so something that uh, feedback that we receive sometimes for, for Dataflow is that it uh, takes a little while to to ramp up on it and takes take some time to learn right so um, we want to we we thought to ourselves okay how do we make it easier for users to do some of the more basic tasks with data flow which is you know moving data from from one point to another uh, how do we make it as easy as possible for for new users of data flow right and so you know we looked at um, some of the puzzle pieces that we had, right? In Beam, we have implementations for, for many different sources, um, streaming and batch sources, Kafka, PubSub, Kinesis, um, as well as BigQuery, et cetera. And we also have implementations to write to data stores, um, which include also Kafka, PubSub, Kinesis, also BigQuery, Bigtable, um, RDBMSs, et cetera, right? So, um, so we also, on top of that, have um, the ability to execute SQL statements, which are, um, you know, relatively simple to construct, um, at least relatively simpler to construct than, than the, you know, writing a bunch of Java code, Python code, Go code, right? So, so considering those things, we decided that we wanted to enable users to, to declare a data flow pipeline from configuration. Um, so they would choose their source and configure it. So if they're connecting to Kafka, they would you know, choose the, the bootstrap uh, server endpoints to start reading from a Kafka topic, choose the topic, um, set up any configuration for authentication, networking for this Kafka topic, uh, and then choose a sync, um, you know, 
like BigQuery, Bigtable. And then a, a very important part of this is we work with, for this meta template is we work with data that has schemas, right? So your data in Kafka and PubSub, there will be, you know, maybe JSON messages or Avro messages um, that are published. And we, we want to consume them knowing what the schema information is. And we want to be able to use that by schema. What I mean is the shape of the data. We want to know what, uh, what columns you have in, in the data that's coming in and what, uh, so that we can parse each row individually. And then we'll take that schema and use it to write it, write your data to, to a data source, which to, to a data store, which you know you'll select and configure, and all of that based on a UI. <clears throat> Finally, we we wanted to allow simple transformations. So not the full, you know, do whatever you want kind of kind of SQL, but more like you know, filter out some columns that you don't want, uh, filter out specific rows, specific ranges for some values that you don't want, um, convert rows to different types that you might want. So this kind of mapping uh, or scalar transforms that you can um, do without needing any SQL aggregations. And so basically it's sort of like a data movement template, but that can be configured for multiple, uh, for any, any source, any of a set of sources, and any of a set of things, right? <clears throat> um, which is, <laughs> this is basically what I learned, a, a template that receives the source and its configuration, a sync and its configuration, along with a, with a simple transformation, right? And so eventually we, um, you know, we have built a template. And so there is a template that supports an input that looks like this. So basically, you pass this kind of JSON input um, where you, you define what's your source, for example, Kafka, um, and you pass the configuration parameters for that Kafka um, consumption. You tell it what topic, bootstrap servers, what format. You also have to tell it what's the schema of your data, or you have to tell it um, where your Confluent schema registry is, for example. Um, Kafka is just one option. Again, we can read from pubs, so pubs would like, et cetera. And you configure your sync as well, right? In this case, we have BigQuery. Um, and yeah, you pass configuration parameters. And so um, we are almost done building a template that supports something like this, where you'll pass this parameter in the, in the command line, um, which is a bit of a headache. You have to pass escape JSON to the command line, but uh, but then you can launch a data flow job. And now what's interesting about this is because um, users are just passing a configuration, we know all of the code on the data flow job. So we can do you know, auto tuning of the job. So um, over time, we plan to work on, on features that improve the execution of the job. So for example, if your if your Kafka source doesn't have enough partitions to to keep up with the um, with the rate of data input, we can reconfigure the template to reshuffle the data slightly um, in between the source and the sync, so that we can increase the throughput uh, that we have when we consume data from the source. Right and. This is, by the way, an issue that hits users frequently, reading from Kafka, reading from Kinesis that have um, a limited number of partitions. And so, you know, this, um, yeah, this sort of thing is, is something that we're going to start working on. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> so I'll tell you a little bit about what was my workflow when working on this. Um, Consider that, you know, let's go back to the beginning, which is uh, we're building a template that is configurable where you can choose your source, your sync, right? Um, and so uh, um, a lot of the pieces are already there in Beam, but we, you know, we wanted to build something and be able to verify that it worked well, right? Um, so my tips for your workflow with Beam and Dataflow is always test on direct runner first. Um, now I, you know, people often have concerns. Oh, 
Um, it feels like they're not always exactly the same. Um, in my experience, uh, being able to test locally on direct runner uh, and have a quick iteration loop is um, is enough and gives enough information. Uh, and once once you move to Dataflow, then yes, you might encounter issues, but those will be more usually related to the scale of your data <coughs> than the differences between the runner implementations. So my advice is to have unit tests um, that run locally and that run with the direct runner. Um, now, when you're testing data stores, we do have some utilities to, to emulate uh, certain data stores. Um, but now there's something that we in the team do a lot is we just use test containers for everything, you know, um, to validate, for example, our Kafka to big table um, flow. We launch a container uh, that has a, a small Kafka instance. We'll launch another container that has a small big table instance, which is possible. And, uh, and make sure that the data movement is correct and the pipeline runs with, within expectations. And so, um, you know, I wrote tests to do this and, and verify this. And, uh, and yeah, this, you know, this gave me a lot of confidence on, on the semantics of, of the template and the pipeline. And I, I highly recommend it. Um, now, <clears throat> as you, might know from systems like these, uh, Dataflow, Beam, et cetera, uh, Spark, Flink, all of these systems, um, they'll behave a certain way. And, and then as you scale up, you will uh, start discovering different, um, you know, different bottlenecks on your scaling, right? Um, so the example that I said, maybe you're starting with a with a Kafka. You're running your local test with a Kafka topic with two partitions, uh, and eventually you realize, okay, well, I, if I want to reach very high data throughput, I can't just have two partitions. I need to have a lot more Kafka partitions, right? So, once you've validated the behavior locally, and you know, test containers again are a great way of validating the the behavior locally and, and making sure that things work. Um, I recommend that you you test for performance and for load. So move to Dataflow and and run tests uh, for load and for performance. Um, what uh, and you might wonder, okay, how do I do this? Like, I don't just have uh, random data laying around. I don't just have uh, random setting of you know with all of my production environment uh, ready to to run example ETL jobs. Um, <clears throat> so what I would say as you develop integration tests, performance and load tests, is uh, you can look at the integration testing framework that we have in the Dataflow templates repository. Um, here's the QR code for it. So what is this integration testing framework? Um, it's a, it's a relatively new framework that we're building to build integration tests. Um, initially, we were doing it for our Dataflow templates. Um, the intention is to make it fully open source, use it for integration tests in Beam. Um, what did we do before? Before we had an internal framework that we use inside Google. Um, but I mean, it, it, does, it just doesn't make sense to have a framework that's only internal. Um, I think it makes sense. It makes a lot more sense to have tools that are open source and published for uh, for anyone to use. Um, so this is what this framework is. Um, it has resource managers for data stores, so um, you can create a pop sub topic, pop sub like uh, reservations, uh, BigQuery data sets, etc. So you we have. Um, an abstraction and a series of implementations that allow you to implement um, different data sources, well, data stores in general. Uh, so for the Google Cloud ones, we currently have, you know, we just set up an actual pub subtopic on Google Cloud, an actual BigQuery data set on Google Cloud. 
well for uh, for example for MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, etc. We we will run a lock a larger local instance with test containers that has networking set up so that the data flow job can connect to it. Um, local meaning that it has to run on usually on on a VM in your in your Google Cloud project, right? So that the networking can so that data flow can reach that VM. Um, so we have those resource managers. We also have uh, data flow job management utilities. So we have um, Maven plugins that can that can help you build your data flow templates. Um, we have small utilities that let you monitor the throughput of the job, let you monitor um, the status of the job, terminate, uh, drain the job, etc. We also have a data generator, which we use extensively. So whenever we, we write an integration or a performance test, we'll kickstart two pipelines, one that generates data into the source and another one that consumes that data. Um, <clears throat> and you know we also have utilities for uh, managing the test configuration, right? So in this case, for example, you know credential management for Google Cloud, so you can pass in, we can work with your application default credentials on the local machine, or you can pass pass an authentication token, et cetera. So it's a it's a very complete um, integration framework that I I highly recommend. Uh, and uh, we don't yet have it in Maven Central, which is where you would you know add it to your to your dependencies and and consume it. Uh, from there, but we, um, our plan is to add it to Maven Central. And at this point, many of the utilities are in a state where people can use them. So I, I recommend it very much for you to just take a look. Um, if you want to see a sample test, just find any files that are, you know, asterisk it.java. Um, these are files that are using this framework, um, yeah, to launch integration tests. Um, cool. Um, that being said, I'll um, I'll jump to some scenarios um, of troubleshooting and debugging issues with data flow jobs. Um, these are these scenarios are come mostly from me, but also from some of my coworkers. Where um, basically I asked people to share stories about debugging jobs and what are you know how they they figure out what was the problem with their with their jobs and, and how do they how do they work around that? <clears throat> um, so before we we jump in, I should say um, this all relies on on Dataflow's existing. Um, let's see, let me get the laser pointer. Dataflow's existing monitoring utilities. So everything on this tabs here, and also the 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 custom metrics here. Um, so basically, that's all we look at when we uh, when we debug jobs. And you know, over time, we've been doing a much better job at um, showing more and more of our monitoring on on the Dataflow UI. And so, you know, I I am very um, happily impressed with how much we've improved it recently. Anyway, so for um, we have uh, the useful indicators that we have are the SDK provider metrics. These are metrics reported by code in the Beam SDK or in the user transformations. Um, we have, like I said, data flow monitoring metrics. So you, you can go to job metrics and see, you know, base, you'll see basically charts over time that look at the throughput of the job, CPU utilization, um, data freshness. Uh, Etc. There's many charts here, uh, very valuable. Um, we also have what we call execution details. Um, this um, this execution details section is very useful because it lets you look at how the workflow of the job ex is executing. Um, and uh, but yeah, I'll. Uh, I'll look into, you know, I'll show you examples of how each one of these is useful. Um, all right, then. so scenario number one, um, 
this this was from a user. Uh, they found that uh, their pipeline was uh, writing to to an external source, and it was too slow. Mm. So when a sync of yours is is very slow, um, many of our syncs publish uh, metrics for their batch size and latency. We have this, this is the data store IO uh, sync, but we have the same thing for, for BigQuery syncs. Uh, I believe we have it also for, for JDBC IO, writing to relational databases. Um, we have it for many syncs. And so looking in this pipeline, we can see the batches that we're sending to the sync. What do we mean by a batch is when we're writing a bunch of data to, to a sync, in this case, when we're writing a bunch of mutations to data store, um, we, we bundle it up together in groups. Uh, and we send a group of elements uh, to be applied at the same time, right? Why do we do it in groups? Because it allows us to amortize the, the request, um, the fixed cost of issuing a request to an external data store. Uh, so if we're able to batch a bunch of elements together without increasing the latency on our pipeline, then we can we can increase the throughput, right? And so in this case, the issue with this pipeline is our batches, uh, the mean size of our batches is one. So basically we have one element batched up for every external call that we make to, to apply a mutation to data store, um, which means that we have very inefficient communication with data store. Um, and the maximum size of our batches is two. So basically, we have at most two elements on every single network request to data store. Um, and so by looking at this batching metrics, one can figure out that uh, that we're just too slow right now. Um, too, not too slow, we're not batching enough. And so um, this is an example actually from one of the data flow manage templates. And so by looking at the template code, uh, we were able to figure out that there was a bug in the template that was causing this batching to be too small. Um, now a healthy, um, this is an example of uh, JDBC IO. And uh, this is an example of, of batching of elements written to a relational database. In this in this pipeline, we show that there's pretty healthy batching, um, right? So the mean number of elements that are included in a batch written to, to this relational database is 100 elements. So we're putting 100 elements together and sending a network request to the database to write them. So um, that that makes our you know our pipeline much more efficient. <laughs> we have a maximum of twenty five thousand elements that we're sending in a single batch to the database, which is which is amazing. Um, and we have we this transform in particular also publishes a distribution of of uh, latency uh, for each batch, uh, where we have about twelve milliseconds of latency to apply each batch, which is really good. Um, now, in this case, the maximum is, is actually quite high. We have almost nine seconds of latency to apply a batch. Um, we don't have more detailed statistics on the distribution, but considering that the mean is likely to be skewed, um, a mean of 12 milliseconds per batch is really good. Um, so, um, so tips. Um, if your sync is exporting any batching metrics, look at them. Go look at your metrics, see, see how things are looking. Um, if the batches are small, then that's that means there's inefficiency in, in your network utilization, your CPU utilization. Um, it's also good to look at the latency per request. Um, and you know, the the other hand of this advice is if you're adding connectors, you're adding data. Uh, network connections to your pipelines that are reaching to external service, add this kind of batching metrics to your own connectors so that you can go and look at your own your own kind of monitoring that basically you are designing yourself and see how your pipeline is, is behaving, right? 
Um, all right, we have scenario number two. Um, now, scenario number two is interesting because of um, because the you know, as you know, data flow has auto scaling, and the auto scaler works pretty well. Uh, but it has it has a few um, corner cases that that it can hit sometimes. Now, how does the auto scaler work? In short, um, there's two competing algorithms. Uh, so every every few seconds, the data flow auto scaler will look at how many workers we have, and then it will look at a few metrics. Uh, the most important metric is CPU utilization. So what percentage of the CPU is being utilized uh, by each worker. Um, but when we decide whether to upscale or not, we also look at the backlog of your job. Um, so what this means is that if, you're, if your CPU utilization is low, but your uh, but your backlog is uh, is very high. Your the autoscaler might decide to scale up. Um, you know, maybe your pipeline is not a, the kind of pipeline that needs a lot of CPU, but it is building a, la a long backlog. So we need to try to get through that backlog, right? Um, now, there's this works in many cases, but there's cases where it won't work, um, and so. Uh, we've seen this in pipelines where, you know, here's the throughput metric from the from the job metrics tab. Um, we see that the pipeline is running with five workers, and then scales up to a hundred because there's a very long backlog. So the autoscaler um, assumes that we need more workers to get through that backlog, um, but the throughput barely increases. The throughput increased by, you know, what looks like five percent. Right. Um, so why does this happen? Uh, in this case, it was a pipeline that was reading from uh, from a message queue from Kafka, and so we had a limited set of partitions. I believe it was ten partitions total. Um, and so what happens is, even if we scale up, uh, we don't have enough work for a hundred workers. But the autoscaler will uh, will try to to get through that backlog. Right. Um, so. In this case, what happened is we, um, the, you know, we first of all had to ask the customer to go back to their Kafka cluster and increase the number of partitions so that we could we could consume more data from those partitions. Uh, and the other thing we had to ask them is, you know, set the maximum number of workers to a reasonable max, uh, because if you have a hundred workers that are doing the exact same amount of work as five workers uh, you're getting billed 20 times more and you know this these are issues for a customer and it's a it's somewhat of a misbehavior of, of the autoscaler so so you know it's 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 annoying for customers and we we usually um, you know need to engage closely to help them resolve the issue right so um, so yeah in this case you know, Consider that the parallelism of of your pipeline is usually constrained by the parallelism of your source. Okay, so if your source is able to reach very high throughput, your pipeline will reach very high throughput. If your source is not, it's likely that your pipeline cannot reach much higher than you know anything higher than your source. Um, and so, you know, setting a maximum number of workers is a good idea in general because it can limit you know the expense on your data flow jobs. Right. Uh, by the way, again, this is on the job metrics tab, and you can see many metrics. Um, some of the most important metrics are, like I said, CPU utilization, throughput, uh, data freshness. Uh, but we have so many metrics. We have. Um, I'll show you some another scenario where we use these metrics to figure out uh, another issue with a job. Um, so we have scenario number three. Um, something, an issue that is very common in batch jobs is uh, stragglers. Um, so it might happen that you'll have a batch job that takes a very long time to finish, although it seems like it's not processing much data. Um, 
This can be due to straggler workers. Um, what do we mean by straggler workers? Well, you can, if you go to the execution details tab in your, in your Dataflow um, UI, you can see there's a worker pro progress graph and it can show you um, how much activity each worker is having, right? And so in this particular graph, we can see there's all of these different threads that are doing uh, work, but they're only doing work for a fraction of the time of the pipeline. And there is one thread that is, you know, that is taking the longest to do the work. Um, and so what happens in this case is before the pipeline can finish or before the next stage of the pipeline can continue to execute, we need to wait for the, for the slowest of the workers to finish. Um, so by looking at the execution details, if you can see a case like this where, where you'll have one worker with uh, that is straggling that has very long execution time, um, or you know that is active while all of the other workers are inactive, um, that can mean several things. It can mean that you have a hot key, uh, or it can mean that the the splitting in your in your pipeline is not uh, it's not good. So in this, so some recommendations in this case is you can reshuffle your data so that the data gets redistributed among workers, and there is not one worker that has has extra load. Um, and yeah, so this is something that you can very well figure out from the execution details. Um, all right. Uh, scenario number four. Um, so we sometimes have some messages in Dataflow uh, that speak about uh, GC thrashing, which is um, kind of the Java VM uh, Java virtual machine getting stuck in a loop of doing garbage collection, executing a bit of code, needing to do garbage collection, executing a bit of code, and so on. <clears throat> when we find that the that the JVM is spending too much time doing garbage collection, um, we we usually restart that worker because it means that there's something in the worker that allocated too much memory, and so you know, we, we just want to clean up that memory. Um, so how do you detect this? One way is uh, you'll see GC thrashing in the logs. Another thing you, you might see sometimes is um, multiple errors happening on the same step, um, but are not, um, not quite easy to, to pinpoint uh, as to what's the reason. So what you can do in these cases is you can go and look again at your at your job metrics tab, and uh, and in this case we have a memory utilization metric, and we can see <laughs> it, it. This is very much a, a you know memory leak or GC thrashing kind of uh, kind of chart where. Um, we reach a limit in, in memory utilization, then we kill the worker, then we reach a limit again, kill the worker again. And so in cases like this, what we recommend is for, is for users to use high memory workers or to enable vertical autoscaling. Um, vertical autoscaling, uh, what does that mean? So you know, horizontal autoscaling is when we add more workers Vertical autoscaling is when we figure out that the worker needs to be of a different size and we scale up the size of the worker. Um, so if we have a lot of workers running out of memory, we'll, you know, we'll figure out, okay, well, this, this job has, you know, this job has workers that need more memory. And so we'll, we'll spin up workers that have higher memory. Um, and the, the example here is, uh, you know, there's many examples. Sometimes a lot of I.O. in flight can cause this. Sometimes uh, loading very large machine learning models can overload the, the memory of the, of the worker. So you know, those are those are some examples that can give memory pressure to the workers. Um, yeah, so these are four scenarios that I, oh. These are four scenarios where we look at the, um, 
um, at the default data flow metrics and figure out why why you know something might be going wrong. Um, I will say <laughs> maybe it's not great advice, but just go look at it, see all of the metrics that we have around, um, and you know it's uh, if you know if something looks strange or, or doesn't make sense, it's good to ask questions. Um, I'll, I'll share a link at the end on where to ask questions. Um, but it's good to ask questions, right? So for example, maybe your pipeline is doing okay, but the CPU utilization is very low. Um, if that's happening, then that could be an indication that your pipeline is inefficient. And maybe, again, it's doing well, but maybe you can save some money by looking at the pipeline and figuring out you know, why it's inefficient and how can we increase the CPU utilization so that we're not wasting resources, right? Um, so the tip in cases like this is to go in and use data flow profiling. Um, our profiling support is, has improved significantly. Um, here's a link for it. I think I forgot to set up a, a QR code. Or did I? Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, you can enable profiling uh, on all of our SDKs with just a flag and then see the results on the, um, on the cloud profiler. And then you can you can go and find all the different operations and how much time they're taking on your worker. Um, you know we'll aggregate all the profiles and everything. So um, that's what you know. For what it's worth, when we do performance optimizations, that's what we do, right? That's that's what we go and look at to try to figure out which operations are slow uh, that we can optimize. So highly recommended <coughs> doing profiling. Um, all right, and now uh, talking about this template that I was working on, the meta template. Uh, like I said, um, going back to, to the meta template that I was working on, we wanted uh, a flexible, configurable data movement pipeline, right? Just a pipeline to move data from A to B. Uh, and that could be fully managed, right? So. Uh, so we also wanted, by fully managed, we wanted to try to, to add things like automatic SDK updates, right? So maybe you've run pipelines, jobs that are running for a long time, and you start getting deprecation warnings for older SDK versions, right? So because in this case, we, we built the template and we, we know the code that it has, we can drain the template and start a new instance of it uh, that applies uh, all of the necessary SDK updates, and and you know remove all of these uh, deprecation issues and not lose any data, so you don't have to manage it, right? Um, automatic response to pipeline slowdowns. We we want to add, you know, when we think about this product, we we get a little excited and we're like, oh, we can we can come up with all sorts of uh, um, fully managed features, right? So one feature that we thought is, you know, respond automatically to pipe the pipeline slowing down by tuning the pipeline somehow, right? Now, it turns out that it's hard to, you know, in an automated way, figure out what does it mean to tune the pipeline if it becomes slow. It often just means having a reshuffle that allows you to, par to reparallelize, repartition your data so that you don't have a single worker being overloaded. Um, uh, but, you know, which is something that we might add. But yeah, I think running a template like this will let us, you know, get more knowledge about the needs of, of our sinks and sources and the needs that our users um, are having and um, make it a better experience for users. And we want to make it mostly UI based. So anyway, if you are curious about this template, you want to try it, um, you can email me. This is my email. and Or you can email our product manager, Meran. Here's his email. Um, and you can tell us about your use case. Um, generally, this is for use cases where you want to move data from A to B. Uh, you want to do it continuously. And you want to you know, ideally not have to worry about it once you start it. Right. Um, 
And so because it's a it's a new thing, we we you know we're willing to spend some time to help you spin it up. Um, yeah, so please feel free to reach out if you want to try out this template. Um, the template code, it's all open source. It's on the Dataflow templates repository. Um, so you can you can you can go take a look uh, there as well. Um, all right then, uh, a little fast. I'll answer questions uh, in the end, but first I'll let Lauren uh, tell you about the cloud community. Amazing. Thank you so much, Pablo, for going through this information and some of the troubleshooting scenarios. Hopefully this was helpful for you. And I see that we did get a few questions in the chat, um, but if you have any others, please feel free to add those in and we'll be sure to get to them. Um, but before we do, and we had some pre-submitted questions that we're gonna go through as well, but um, before we do, just a few additional links here. Um, that link at the top and also in the YouTube description is to the community. So this is where you can ask questions and find answers. And especially the link in the YouTube description is to the data analytics community in particular, where you can ask questions specifically around data analytics and data flow. And then we'd love to hear from you, your feedback on this uh, session, what you'd like to see for future topics or any additional questions or feedback you have with that second link. Um, and we'll drop it into the chat as well. Um, but this really helps us make sure that this uh, content and the experiences that we're providing are useful. So we'd love to hear from you there. And then lastly, um, you know, a couple of uh, upcoming events that we have in particular, just to call out on March 30th, um, you know, if you're using Dataflow, we have another session on simplifying data operations with the Splunk Dataflow template. So do check that out at that link and uh, hopefully we will see you there. With that, um, we will jump over to the Q&A. So if you wanna go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Started. Yep. All right, so um, there was a good question uh, of what is the best way to surface data flow errors without going through each job? Uh, this was, don't recall what this question came up. I actually didn't know a good answer, I, um, but it turns out you know, we do have uh, cloud error reporting is, uh, is an aggregator of, of errors in your, in your cloud um, environments. This is the Apache Beam testing project. So almost every every issue here is related to Dataflow. But you can filter by resources where you you know where you focus on Dataflow jobs. Um, and so that way you can you can find errors and you can even find timelines of these errors and um, you know distributions, etc. You can filter by time. So it's it's a really nice utility to see an aggregated view of how errors are occurring. Oh, no way. Uh, so yeah, definitely take a look at that. Now, before I continue, I've seen there's two questions on the chat. Should I answer those, Lauren? Yeah, let's do it. So our first question is, Autoscaler OK to use with data in a production environment? Yes. Uh, Definitely, yes. Um, the issue that I described earlier is just a corner case that this autoscaler can hit, but we have you know, thousands of users using Dataflow with the autoscaler, and it's, um, it's very useful, right? It, it, can, it can help you, especially for streaming pipelines. It works for both, but, but for streaming pipelines, it really helps because you don't have to you know, pre-tune your, your pipeline uh, for the size that you expect your data and then retune it when you have a different amount of data. So yes, definitely use the autoscaler uh, most of the time. You know, I only don't use the autoscaler when when I am running a test and I want to test against a fixed number of workers. Makes sense. All right. Um, what is the difference exactly between a job and a pipeline? Should I convert my job to a pipeline? Yeah, so this is, I think here we um, we haven't done a great job at communication. Um, we are using terms that I that are overloaded a lot. Um, so Beam has a pipeline uh, term in Beam itself, not in Dataflow. Um, so that is one of the pipelines. For Dataflow, we have jobs, which is when you launch a when you take a Beam program 
uh, you launch it and it'll create a data flow job, right? And the job either as a batch job will run and finish or as a streaming job will continue to run indefinitely. Um, that's a job, right? Uh, we also added a feature called data pipelines. Uh, data pipelines are it's intended to be a higher level feature that lets you manage your jobs better. And so um, you can set up, for example, a batch job that runs periodically, right? So you can create that as a data pipeline job. Uh, you can create a data pipeline and you give it a schedule on how often to run your job that perhaps, for example, runs database exports every night or you know every week. Um, so should you convert your job to a pipeline? Um, I think you should uh, look up data flow data pipelines and see if the if the features of data pipelines are what you need, um, which is generally uh, managing the schedule for running your jobs. If if they meet your need, then yeah, you can do that. If not, um, then I think it's fine to keep it as a job and run it as normal data flow jobs. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. Um, OK, so we'll go back now. Yep. Yeah. If you have any other uh, questions or follow-ups to those, please uh, yeah, just use the chat. But we'll keep going through some of these pre-submitted questions. Um, so how to save yep. variables in pipeline for later use as an input to a Beam function? Yep. Uh, so this is uh, this is a common question. I think the easiest way of um, doing this is by a side input. Um, so in Beam, we have a way of, let's say, in your, in your job, you are computing something uh, as the job goes. And you know maybe it's an aggregation, or maybe it's a it's a big table that you want to use later for enriching your data, or or something like that. Uh, in that case, we um, you can use a side input to take that computation that you just made, convert it into what we call a view, which is basically a. a you know, it's basically a, a readable uh, version of this computation. And the, you know, the workers can then read from that. Another thing that we, that we have for the Python SDK, which is recommended when you're loading large machine learning models, is this share.py utility, uh, which lets you uh, spin up a or lets you load an object into memory that can be shared by multiple threads. And so we, you know, the, the TensorFlow people, uh, team and TensorFlow extended users, they use it a lot for loading mo models into memory and, uh, and not having to load them multiple times uh, and overload the work. So um, by the way, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm I'm going to plug someone someone's book, but this second link here, using side inputs, um, directs to a recent book that was written about Beam uh, by one of the Beam committers. Uh, they don't work on Dataflow. They um, they they are a, he's a freelancer, so it's a very good book on Beam. So if you're interested, it looks like the version. It's a good part of it is available online, but it's in general a good book. So if if you want to Take a look. It's it's interesting. Um, All right, uh, and those links are also in the chat, so you can um, quick link on those. Um, how do you handle deadlock when using Dataflow Beam for ETL jobs into relational databases? Yeah, so these questions come from Reddit or or from other communities. Lauren was very nice to 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 compile them. Um, so in this case, we would, I would need to look at the specific uh, need. I would guess um, that the deadlock could be happening because we are trying to do parallel trans transactions to the same primary key, for example. And so in cases like that, you can group your data by primary key first so that when you're trying to write it to your external source, 
uh, you know, the, all of the data for the primary key will be together and it won't cause a deadlock. But, you know, maybe that's not exactly what's happening. Um, there's a couple more questions uh, about, you know, how, how to do something in particular with your, with your data flow jobs. And what I would say in this case is, you know, go to, go to our questions help, uh, to, to our questions page, which is uh, googlecloudcommunity.com. And you know you can ask questions there, tag them with Dataflow, and uh, you know we, we will do our best to answer them. Um, yeah. Awesome. There was one question where I where I wanted to where I could give a decent answer. Um, the question is: I've created a pipeline using the Dataflow uh, UI uh, with a Google provided template. How do I programmatically create other pipelines that are copies of this pipeline, but with a couple parameters change? You can do that, you know, if you go to, um, if you want to create a job from template um, and, you know, let's say uh, you, let's see, we're doing JDBC to <laughs> uh, JDBC to BigQuery. Um, and so we request this template and, you know, we fill the parameters. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Once we fill the parameters, before we launch the job, we can get the command for, from the command line that we can use to launch it from our own shell. Uh, and so we can take this command and write a program that can edit the, you know, the different parameters that you want to pass to it. And so, you know, if you want to programmatically launch templates, you can, uh, you can do this, and that'll you know, you can scale up your, your job launching. Uh, Love it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Pablo. Um, so we did have one final question. And then unless there are any others, I think we'll close it out for today. But we had one referencing a direct runner for testing if we had any documentation or at least um, information that we can share for now on that. Yeah. Um, we have a couple things. Um, we have a page in our documentation called Test Your Pipeline, which um, shows some of the high-level patterns that we use for writing test pipelines. Um, we have this utility called Test Pipeline, and we have another We have this key assert utility or assert utility um, that lets you write um, assert expectations. Uh, for your pipeline. And we should also have an, a really cool streaming um, local stream utility. I don't see it here, so let me let me look it up. This stream. Um, all right, so I'll paste this two links on the on the on the chat and I think I'm pasting it on the on the private chat, but Lauren can probably help me put it in the comments. And and yeah, so these are these are really good links to, on writing um, unit tests for your for your pipelines. I would also add um, the Dataflow templates repository is a good uh, oops <laughs> delete it too much uh, a good resource. To look at, you know, samples of data flow pipelines. So um, you can see we have tests there. We have unit tests. We have integration tests, uh, and so you can see some of the patterns that we use uh, to test our pipelines. Awesome. Thank you. And yes, we'll share a collection of all of these resources and links in the recap post as well. Um, so you can refer back to them. All right. all right. I think that is all that we have for now. Thank you again so much, Pablo, for your time and your wisdom on troubleshooting issues in Dataflow. Um, any final thoughts or recommendations before we close out today? Um, no, I mean, thanks everyone for tuning in. I, uh, I, see, I see a couple uh, familiar 
uh, names in the chat, but uh, but yeah, um, feel free to reach out if you have questions. You saw my email, and uh, you know I'm kind of slow on emails, but anyway, feel free to reach out, and and that's it. Awesome, thank you. And yeah, we can keep in touch in the community as well in that data analytics uh, link in the description. So we look forward to seeing you at the next one and thanks again. All right, bye everyone.